again, great for the PDIs. Again, we're very pleased to introduce Morgan from Pandemic. Uh, lead designer there, and I'm going to push for a bit longer. But look, Morgan has been designing games from around the world for the past time of the year. Oh, well, there you go. Um, uh, he's, uh, shipped, he's, shipped a, he's shipped a wide variety of games for a wide variety of audience, including Home Worlds 2, Freedom Force, Happy Feet, and more. Well done. He basically convinced the game industry is most, most exciting place in the world to be. At least partially because he's filled with crazy people who are cheering, uh, doing amazing things. Does that include me, mate? Yes, mate. Uh, yeah. His current pet topics are design process and relationship between virtual space and identity. I'm looking forward to it. Please welcome, Morgan. Thank you. Cheers. Um, I'm going to kick things off. I, really, what I want to talk about today is, uh, as it says, the changing role of the lead designer. I think we're really at the cusp of dramatic change in how games are played and the whole business of making games, as well as the, the whole exciting industry of playing games. Um, to give a bit of background, as, uh, as Greg said, I've, uh, I started working in the professional games industry in, uh, in Australia in 1999 at, uh, at Irrational Games, and I shipped Freedom Force there. I, uh, I then left Irrational before they were acquired by, by Take-Two and went to Relic and shipped Home World 2 there. I left Relic before they were acquired by THQ. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I moved on to Ubisoft in, uh, in Montreal where I worked on Split Cell 3, Chaos Theory, doing some writing and some small work for them. And I left before EA acquired a large chunk of them. Then I spent some time at A2A in Montreal doing licensed games and a bunch of really exciting, uh, working with exciting properties, making games that sold three million copies and uh, were slightly less critically acclaimed than the others. Um, at the moment, I've got one game that has like a 90 Metacritic and one game that sold four million copies. My future goals are to have both of those happen on the same game. Um, then I came to Pandemic Studios, and this time I, I got caught in the buyout, um, as EA is now acquired Pandemic Studios. So this is this is who I am. I've, I've been looking really seriously at design for a lot of years now, and uh, as as Greg said in the intro, uh, and as I said then, I, it's just it's an exciting time. Um, so what we're going to cover today is we're going to look at where the role of the designer came from. Who are designers? Do we need them? What do they do, actually? Uh, we're going to look at a bit of what's going on in the world of game design and why. Uh, we're going to look at what the cusp that we're on means in terms of bringing new approaches to, to game design. And uh, I'm going to talk about being a new kind of designer, which is a catalyst rather than an author. And uh, I'll cover what that means. So the question is, first, where did this whole designer thing come from? And when, uh, when creating games began, there was no separate title of designer. Uh, this wasn't a necessary part of the process. We had engineers who made machines that played on, or Space Batman, you know, Space War, or any of those other sorts of things. And that's, that's the design process. It's an engineering challenge. Um, putting together something that people will play and be excited about at that point in time, if there's a line moving on a screen that you were controlling, that, that was pretty exciting. <laughs> so, at, at the very root of, of games, of video games, uh, we're dealing with, with engineering. And it was a while before we even needed artists or designers. However, there, there came a time when somebody to, you know, tune the numbers, put the levels together, became useful. Somebody to make something better art than a line of ball became, uh, became desirable. And thus you, you start getting designers into the picture. Um, so often, in, in these earlier cases, you're dealing with still a small team, a lot of people covering cross-discipline stuff, and we first start to get the title of lead designer coming in here, which is, which is what I'm really interested in talking about, this, this concept of the lead designer. And back in the age we're talking about, lead designers were, were people like uh, 
you know, Peter Molyneux back in the populist days. <coughs> Effectively, these were the product vision keepers. Um, they may also have been engineers, they may also have been artists, they may have been pure designers, but the ultimate point here is that the idea came from them and the uh, ideas were channeled through them. So low-level design decisions went through these people, high-level design decisions went through these people, decisions on features, and even then we had the swirling chaos of the, the game development industry. Um, so, you know, things would bubble up that were unexpected, maybe utilised. But nonetheless, this is, this is a designer who is the vision keeper. And this, to me, is the, the first appearance of the, the lead designer, creative director. A lot of what I'm talking about is really fuzzy as to where it lies in the line between lead designer and creative director. Uh, there's a really good reason for that, and that's because the line between lead designer and creative director is really fuzzy. Um, lots of companies don't have creative directors. Uh, lots of them have the vision keeper role being in the creative director's hands. In some companies, the creative director oversees multiple projects. They, it, it's a slightly different allocation of roles everywhere you look. But the position that I'm really talking about is, is that one that lies between the lead, lead designer and the creative director, and the position that's evolved from this vision keeping role that we're talking about now. So, as we've, we've progressed on to, to bigger and bigger teams, which is really a, a recent um, development, these, these kind of 50 person plus teams, at least, uh, at least in Western game development, um, it's very, it was the very rare title that had more than 50 developers on it, uh, even you know, four or five years ago. Um, now it's a very rare title that doesn't end up with at least 50 people on it, um, in, in terms of you know, AAA and commercial games. So at this point, you start getting serious design teams. You know, anywhere up to 10, 15 level designers, a couple of game designers, maybe a writer, maybe a cinematics director. There's, there's all sorts of people who need to be managed now. And this is where we start to see that the line's becoming a, a little fuzzy as to what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with managing people, trying to get them to execute on design, still trying to make all those low-level design decisions, still trying to make the high-level design decisions about where the game's going, dealing with pressure from publishers or you know, other studios. This, this whole center point that, that the entire project has to run through. And this is, this is a large part of, of what I want to talk about because as the lead designer moves more from being the designer who's at the, the head of the pyramid, through to the designer who is the leader. There's a change in skill set that's necessary, there's a change in what that person has to do, and there's a change in ways that, that this can work. Um, the whole industry is, is heading, in my opinion, into a new direction. Uh, and this is not just in the fundamentals of how our businesses are organised, but it's in the fundamentals of how our games are built and the size and scope and scale of games, and the movement of games to open world, the movement of games to social experiences, the movement of games to systems to be explored. What's happening now is we're talking about design, designers moving from being the authors of game experiences, so coming up with a story that you're going to bring the player through. Even something like Mario is, is a story of progressive levels, progressive experiences, you know, down to a pretty fine mark, what the player experience is at each point in time, what they're going to need to do in order to overcome that, where they're going to move to. And games now are getting bigger than these authored experiences. Don't get me wrong, uh, I really enjoy the authored experiences. The authored experiences is what I was brought up in. Uh, it's, it's what kind of brought me to love games initially, video games especially. And there are some phenomenal stories to be told through games. There's nothing quite like experiencing a story. But none 